We are back on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Your same crew, your same time. Well, it's not really same time because you guys watch this whenever you want, right? <laughs> um, but I'm Derek Rackley, Dave Archer, DJ Shockley, coming to you here from Atlanta Falcons headquarters in Flowery Branch, Georgia. We are recapping a 29-10 victory of the Falcons over the Colts. We will talk about the performance and some players that stuck out. Of course, we got to talk about the quarterback. That was one of the big discussions going into this game. And Taylor Heineke played pretty well as the starter in this one. We'll talk talk a little bit about the state of the NFC South and how things are going to shake up over the next two weeks because there is a lot on the line, not just for Atlanta, but for everybody in the National Football League in these last two weeks of the season. So, fellas, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, some of the things that I thought about as the game was progressing, Arch, it seemed like it was a cleaner game. Um, obviously, Taylor Heineke played well, uh, completed about 70% of his passes. He was like a 55% passer in his three games this year. And when you're thinking about winning football, that needs to be up, like I was thinking, that needs to be up in the 65% area, right? So that's what he does. He's more efficient. You're getting more first downs. You're moving the football up and down the field. What did you see out of Taylor in the offense to start off with? Yeah, we talked about uh, you know, had to take care of the football. It was paramount in the game. We had to, no turnovers that had plagued the team, regardless of where it was on the field. You could see a concerted effort by Taylor to get the ball out and the ball out on time, which meant I'm not pushing it into coverage. If I've got a shot and he took some, uh, he made some good throws in traffic and, and in some tight windows. But he also, when he hit his fifth step and hitched up, boom, the ball was out, Shock. He was finding guys underneath. He found Bijan. Bijan had, what, seven grabs in the game or something like that. He was getting the ball, what I like to play, playing the keyboard. He was mm -hmm. playing the guys underneath. And that's where that completion percentage will jump way up now. Now, all of a sudden, my down and distance situations I'm facing are much more manageable. And now, as an Arthur, as a play caller in Arthur Smith, I'm getting guys involved. And you looked up, and there was one drive that I counted, I think, six different guys, seven different guys touched the football. Mm. I mean, man, that's, that's what you're looking for on the offensive side. So I thought that his idea of the way to play quarterback, still stay aggressive and take some shots, but let's get the ball out. You know, let's not have the problems that we get when we start looking at second and ten, third and nine, that kind of stuff. DJ helps too when you get some reinforcements back in the lineup. Yeah. Uh, we we got a sighting of David Onyemata. We got some offensive linemen back in the mix, and when you get that continuity back, it helps. I mean, Atlanta had 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 they were so fortunate throughout the course of the season health, especially at the lines of scrimmage, aside from the Grady Jarrett injury. But then as we got later in the season, Anyamata gets banged up. And then all of a sudden you start to get a lineman, two linemen, three offensive linemen banged up. You get those guys back, you get them back on the same page, that continuity up front helps a lot for that success offensively. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I thought, you know, uh, there was a concerted effort in the game to run the football too. And I, I love the use of the three backs we had in the ball game. Uh, there were times where, you know, you forced the issue to CP. I think was it coming out of halftime, CP has that, that first or second drive or whatever, and you could see the, the production come from CP in there. And then uh, obviously Tyler and Bijan have been uh, two kind of uh, stalemates for you in that backfield. But he, you speak about it uh, up front. Uh, one guy who I thought played a, a pretty good ball game and has came on late in the season has been the, uh, Zach Harrison, the, the young rookie out of – out of Ohio State. I thought he's, you know, been around the football, him and Emmett Katie as well. Calais uh, made himself a little money uh, this, uh, <laughs> this weekend. Got some change. Got a little change this weekend, getting that, what is it, five and a half now. Uh, but, you know, you, you just love the emergence of those guys up front and the fact that Ryan Nielsen can have four guys rush the passer and you can get home. And you can play, you know, seven guys in coverage and be able to know that those guys can put pressure on the quarterback. And I thought up front that was a big part of the game was moving Minshew, get him off his spot. You forced him to be uncomfortable a lot of the times in his ball game. And he wasn't always just able to just sit in there and just drive the football where he wanted to. And those are the things you like to see, especially on the defense side of the ball. Then, obviously, you mentioned uh, up front on the O-line and being able to run the ball is a big deal and protecting your quarterback. Uh, and I think, Arch, you made a good, good point because we talked about it last week of how would Taylor come out and play in a game like this considering what has happened before with the turnovers, with, you know, is he going to be aggressive throw the football? And I, I remember the, the throw vividly over the middle of the field to Drake London. He's got four guys around him, and he fits it into the tiniest of windows, but it's because he hits that pitch step, hitches up, and he lets the ball go. Mm -hmm. Comes off play action, lets the football go. And that's a confident throw. You don't make that throw if you're thinking about, 
I don't want to force the issue or I don't want to turn the football over. It's a tighter window. But I love the fact that there were times in this ball game where he trusted himself, he trusted his guys on the outside, and dudes made plays. And he, and he trusted his eyes, which is something that we sure. talked about in the podcast last week. And, and, DJ, you and I got a chance to break down the touchdown to Pitts on the halftime show at the stadium because that, to me, is one where – all you get if you just sometimes you just read the defense sure. and you take what they're giving you. And he saw that the flare was controlled. Yep. He had Kyle Pitts on the corner out going over the top, and he knew that he had to step on the defense, and he was able to just drop the ball in the bucket over the top of him. To me, that was just a classic example of you see what you see, and you take advantage of it, and you throw it on time. So he does that. But you guys mentioned the fact that we don't turn the ball over. I think this was the fourth game this year without a giveaway mm -hmm. in the game. And coincidentally, we're three and one in those four games when we don't have a giveaway. And then, of course, this guy named Jesse Bates finds his way to get his Son hands on guy. the football again, Arch. Now tied for second in the National Football League with Geno Stone. Oddly enough, the Ravens have five interceptions on Monday night, but none of them are for Geno Stone. So he doesn't <laughs> end up pulling away. So now Jesse Bates tied for second in the National Football League with six picks, and he set a career high in tackles this year. The guy has been all over the field. No, well, that's just it. He's been everywhere. He's played in the box. He played this the, the interception. He comes and he's playing center field. He's playing the high safety in, in a in a three deep look. And this is one that um, you know, as a quarterback, you can't throw the ball. You can't throw the poster out of the middle safety. So I don't know what Gardner <laughs> Minshew was doing, but it's probably what Shock was talking about. Um, it's a culmination of the pressure. The pressure was on him the entire game, and so he never felt comfortable where he could set his feet and throw it like Shock was saying. So I'm constantly moving in the pocket, and even on that play, he's trying to slide up in the pocket and throw it on the move to Pierce, who's going to the post, who, oh, by the way, A.J.'s in his hip pocket, and you got a center fielder in, in Jesse. But it seems like Jess has done a really good job of being in the right place most every time. We it started at the beginning of the year where he was able to steal a couple from Bryce Young, mm -hmm. and he's been that guy, whether it's in the run game. I mean, he comes down and plays guys in man coverage in the slot, and then he playing middle safety in the zone. Uh, the guy's been everything they could have possibly hoped for as their big-time free agent acquisition. You know, let's go back and talk a little bit more about Taylor Heineke because, guys, it was, you know, a big discussion this past week. It's been this discussion the entire year is the quarterback position. And I think his performance kind of just shows that at some times in the National Football League, if you get complimentary football, DJ, if you get good, solid special teams, your defense plays really well like Atlanta has on that side of the ball all season long, but then you just kind of do your job, right? Sometimes they want to call it a game manager, whatever you want to call it, but 229 yards, one touchdown, no picks, not necessarily blowing the top off of the stat sheet, fellas, but he did what he had to do for this offense to be successful, to put points in the board, 29 points, and to win the football game. It doesn't always have to be the 350 yards in the four touchdown game because a lot of times when that happens, what do we know? They're throwing it 35 or 40 times, and that can be a problem a lot of times, even in the National Football League. And the, the – the moniker of a game manager, I think, if you're not managing the game as Thank a quarterback, you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what are we doing? Like, come on. Like, how, how big, how much would Kansas City have taken a game manager in their on. game against the Raiders? No doubt. Oh, by the way, their guy's Patrick Mahomes. He didn't manage that game at all. Yeah. So, yeah, it's unbelievable when I hear that and, you know, people make the. The conversation about it and, you know, if you can't get out of the huddle, you you can't distribute the football. Those are all things guys do that can manage a ball game. So yeah. uh, I'll be, be a game manager all day long <laughs> if, if I'm Taylor Heineke or, you know, the quarterback that can make plays. And, you know, I think one of the best compliments I heard was from Johnu Smith who said, this guy just commands the huddle, he commands his job, and he understands what needs to go down in, in a ball game, and we respect the way he plays. He just comes in and he does his thing. And I think that's probably one of the things that, that sticks out for me when you look at Taylor is, yeah, uh, he talks about still being there for Dez, still allowing Dez to, you know, run the, uh, the, the meetings and all that kind of stuff. And this guy continues just to be exactly what you brought him in for. This guy's a seasoned vet. He's been there. He's done it. He's won ball games. He's played in his league. He understands what it takes to get the guys around him to play better. And as a quarterback, Arch, me and Arch, you know, you are only as good as those other 10 dudes around you. And if those other 10 dudes around you don't believe in you, it don't matter how much talent you got. Yep. You can look at anybody else around this league who you look at as the premier quarterbacks in this league. They have to have guys around him. And you just talked about Arch and a guy and Patrick Mahomes. The guys around him aren't really helping him. Yeah, and right point. now, everybody's looking at him like, what's going on with the Chiefs? But 
you got to have dudes around you who are willing to help you make those plays. And I think Taylor's done a good job of being that guy for all year long when his time is called, when his number's been called. He's stepped in there and he's made plays. And I think the best thing that he did in this ball game was his decision making. Some of the decisions he made in the ball game. I remember there was a simple flat route to Bijan. Uh, they they run a a simple two man concept to to a side, and the flat defender just holds off that number two receiver and he gets it to Bijan right now. It turns into a 11, 12 yard game. Yep. If he holds on to that football or wants to try to force it down the field, guess what? You don't get you know one of your best players in space. The small little minute details that you never think about, that decision was big because guess what? It kept them on schedule. Mm -hmm. It kept them moving the chains. Those are little things that, you know, uh, maybe doesn't get talked about in the media all the time, but those little things within a ball game help a quarterback and help a team, and then ultimately, like Arch has mentioned, it helps a play caller feel good about things they can call in a game. And I thought he got better throughout the game with Mm -hmm. it, too, because he hadn't been playing. Obviously, uh, he hadn't played since, what, the Cardinal game, so – He's been so you can get stuck, and I'm sure Shock and I have both been it, where you hadn't you hadn't been on the field, and so you get you get stuck on a route as as far as waiting for him to come open mm-hmm. as opposed to immediately getting off of it. Yeah. And uh, an example of that was right at the end of the first half, where he's got just a flat corner com- combination on that side of the field, and he gets stuck on Drake on the corner route, and he's got Bijan in the flat. If he jumped at Bijan right now, it's a touchdown. Now he got to him late. But he got to him, and he's out of bounds. Remember, he yeah, catches yeah, the ball yeah, out of yeah. bounds. Yeah. If his eyes immediately come off a of Drake, I don't have it. Boom, the corner's sinking. Bang, I'm going to hit the f- back in the flat. He scores a touchdown. Yeah. He did that in the second half. He yeah, went yeah. back to exactly what you're saying, and, and, and the ball came out. And all of a sudden – and so that can happen. And so he progressed in the game. Not only did he play well throughout the game, but I thought he progressed in the game, which bodes well for this weekend. Yeah, maybe that's one of those looking at the pictures, looking at the the, the iPads down mm-hmm. on the sidelines, saying, okay, yeah, I did hang on that route a little bit too long. Look at him. He was wide open yeah. right here. But for the most part, you guys talked about him keeping the offense on schedule and realizing that when you get in the red zone, you got to get points, right? Mm-hmm. And he allowed Young Way Koo to help score points. So congratulations to Young Way, Young Way Koo, NFC Special Teams Player of the Week after – You know, a couple performances this year that he'd like to have back because he's been known to be such an accurate kicker. He goes five for five on his field goals, a couple of extra points, 17 points. We know, fellas, the weapon that this guy can be if you give him an opportunity, and it's good to see his mental toughness after a couple of misses that he comes right back and he has a perfect week. He's a a guy that's got, if you can say this about a kicker, a guy that has a little swagger to him. He's not a big dude either. But the guy played DB in high school in New Jersey. Came down to Georgia Southern, kicked down here, but he's got kind of that nasty, kind of nasty mentality for a kicker, and so I think his mentality, his his mental toughness is pretty good. That's his third time in his career, he's gone five for five in a game with five field goals. So Arch, I couldn't help but realize when I walked in today that you've already got your board in front of you yeah. for the Bears game. <laughs> And so, like, just like the players are out practicing as as we are recording right now, like Arch is already locked in on the Bears. <laughs> Trying to grind. So, up. Yeah. so we let's, need a W. Let's dive yeah. into it. Yeah. Uh, because we know, like, the situation for the everybody knows the situation for the Falcons. You got to win out, and you're probably going to have to get some help. So, guess what? All you got to do is worry about winning the next game. Um, so Atlanta's going to have to go on the road. They're going to have to pick, face a Chicago Bears team that you you could say is a game that they can win. But you would say that about Arizona, and you would have said that about Carolina, yep. right? So you can't necessarily just look at an opponent and say, yeah, we should win. you got to go out and execute. Some of the challenges that Atlanta is going to face facing Chicago this weekend. Well, first of all, is the obvious one is what is the situation going to be from a weather standpoint. Yeah. Um, Chicago can be nasty. Believe me, I had to play that 85 bear defense, and something was falling from the sky, and it wasn't snow or rain. It was like icicles that were sticking into the ground. I've told that story before, I think. So – um, but Chicago um, is a defense that has rebuilt itself a little bit. You know, when you start thinking about, they went out and got Tremaine Evans, the linebacker from Buffalo. He comes in, he's the linebacker. Rokon Rokon's gone in Philly. Uh, all here comes Montez Sweat, who they required during the season as an edge player. Demarcus Walker, anybody that's followed football here in the South knows Demarcus Walker is a guy that's a big time player out of Florida State. And then they've got some nice guys they rotate in the interior. All that being said, what they've added that up to is the number one defense in the league against the run. Yeah. They're giving up 80 yards a game on the ground, and, and which means they're not giving up a lot of first downs. Now, they're not great on third down. This is a team that's in the back 
fourth of the league in, in, in third down defense. But what they are really good at is they don't give you a lot of first downs, meaning you're having a tough time, uh, you know, getting first downs on first and second down. So they're they're limiting how much you're having the football. So defensively, it's a salty group. So they they take the football away. They lead or they're near the top of the league. I think second in the league in interceptions with 18. So that part of it's working for them as well. Guys, just to let you know, it's for whatever an extended forecast is worth, Uh-oh. okay? It's Wednesday as we shoot this podcast right now, so we still have some time for things to change. But high of 36, low of 29, and I don't see any precipitation in the forecast. Yeah, it yeah. says winds 10 to 15 miles an hour. Okay. If you're playing in Chicago take that all day. in this time of the year, week 17 as you call it, You'll take that. Yeah, yeah. You're okay with that. That's that's a good day in Chicago this time of year, Agreed. DJ. So maybe Element's not going to be an issue for Atlanta as they face the Bears. Which is always a positive. I mean, they played in some Elements this year. Obviously, the Carolina game was a a, a game that, w- that dealt with Elements, and you got to deal with it. But yeah, at the end of the day, even if there are Elements, both teams have to deal with it, and you have to play the game. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You, you prefer not to, of course. Um, but, yeah, this is, this is a game I, I think you look at – and, and RC did a good job of breaking down what, what they look like on that defensive side of the ball. And I think on offense, it, it comes down to their quarterback in Justin Fields. And he's their leading rusher on the team. Um, they're second in the league in rushing at almost 142, uh, you know, a, a game. They're near the bottom in passing, though. Uh, but they're still in the offense with D.J. Moore and, you know, Cole Komet, Darnell Mooney, guys who, could, uh, who can definitely hurt you. I mean, D.J. Moore's got 83 for over 1,000 yards this year. Uh, but the thing that that's hurt them over, you know, I say Justin's career or even the last three games has been Justin's completion percentage. You look at versus Detroit, he was 57 percent versus Cleveland, 47 percent versus Arizona, 55 percent. So even though he's, you know, it looked like he's played a little bit better, uh, this still is a, a, a team that runs through Justin Fields and, and runs through uh, DJ Moore, who has played some really good football for them, uh, but. This is going to be one of the biggest tests because of his ability to be able to create and get outside and extend plays. And that's something that, you know, over the years, quarterbacks who've been able to do that, I think you've done a good job over the past few weeks of trying to keep guys like that within the pocket. But he's a guy that can hurt you once he gets outside. Yeah, and Atlanta's faced a couple of running quarterbacks. I go back to the Arizona game when Kyler Murray got back into the game. He knows how to run around. Chicago coming off a 27-16 victory, and Justin Fields, nine carries, 97 yards in that game. Mm-hmm. That's that's one of the weapons that this offense has at all times. Um, probably playing one of the more athletic quarterbacks in the league as far as getting outside of the pocket. It's what everybody knows. However, I would also add, Arch, that he's thrown three picks in the last two weeks. So there's going to be some opportunities for Jesse Bates and the rest of the defense to make some plays. But it's being disciplined in rush lanes, understanding where Justin Fields is when he can hurt you, and, of course, play calling as well. Sometimes you got to be careful with man coverage when you're going up against a running quarterback like Justin Fields and you got all your defenders turning their back on the quarterback. That's when you get some of those explosive runs from the quarterback position. Yeah, absolutely. And so as Ryan Nielsen begins to get ready for this one, if we want to play man coverage, and that's something he likes to do, um, do you begin to now be – the venture into the spy concept mm-hmm. where you begin to try to have a guy. Now, do you have a guy that can run with this guy? This guy is an outstanding. He's, he's got great speed. So now are we talking about a DB that rocks in there. Do you think Caden Ellis can, can go sideline to sideline? Caden Ellis can run pretty well. Is he enough that if you want to play man coverage in the secondary, I have somebody that can shadow Justin Fields get. Now that's the number one problem is the quarterback off schedule. Mm-hmm. If he wants to throw on schedule, and you may see a a game plan where as much as we want to get out the passer and run stunts, this might be one of those games where you're mush rushing him and we're not doing a lot of in tackle stunts and those type of things. You're just staying in your lanes and coming off the ball and you're pushing him one way or the other. Don't allow him to escape through the middle of the pocket. You've got to make him flush to the outside, limit him to one side of the field. And then you can you can kind of rally to the football. Yeah. That's what you're going to have to. And this guy's going to get out. He's going to make a couple plays that can't be discouraging to you to get off your game plan. Khalil Herbert's running the ball well too. He's over 100 yards last weekend as well. They ran for what 250 yards in the game last weekend. Yeah. That's their where their bread and that's where their bread is buttered is is in the run game. Whether it's just an off schedule or Khalil Herbert's running the football. Got to make them settle into those third and seven, third and eight situations, and now don't let 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 Fields get out of the pocket. Right, so let me ask you this: Is a game like this that we just talked about with a guy like Justin would? Because Ryan's done this, you know, a couple times this year. 
would it be more beneficial to do zone blitz as opposed to, okay, we're blitzing and you got man coverage and a guy's just turning their backs where you're still bringing pressure, but then the secondary still has eyes on the quarterback. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. I think that's a great point, Shock. I think that the more eyes you can have on this dude, that means the more hats you can get to him when he gets out of the pocket. Make no mistake, he's going to – He's going to feel some heat. He has not been, and he's not an accomplished pocket pass by any stretch of the imagination. Yep. Now he's made some plays from the pocket, but that's not his game. He wants to break you down outside the pocket, and so that's what Atlanta's going to have to defend is him trying to get out. And how many eyes can I keep on that? Shock makes a great point. I need to have a lot of guys looking at him. So if you get, if you do decide to go with some zone pressure, bring linebackers and drop ends. Atlanta does have more leaner athletic ends, the, the Ebicades of the world, the Bud Dupree's of the world, guys that can run out in space. So that is definitely an option for them if they decide. Or just, to... or just make him prove that he's willing to do what Taylor Heineke did this yeah. weekend and drop the football off. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead and rush four and drop seven off and say, okay, I got seven eyes on you. Yep. Are you going to be willing to not shoot the ball down the field? Are you going to be willing to lay the ball off? And then our team's been pretty good tackling-wise. I think it's a pretty good tackling defense. We had some moments early in the year, but they've been pretty good recently. So you talked a little bit about the matchup. It's 6-9 and nine Bears team. that it, the, the matchup, again, on paper looks pretty good. Atlanta's defense has been playing well. They're going to rise up to the challenge against an athletic quarterback and a team that likes to run the football, well can run right the there, football. Right. That's well used right there, Ray. What's that? Rise up to the challenge. There you That's go. That's pretty good right, right? There. It's, it's yeah. subliminal. Yeah. It's just it's embedded it's, it's into it's my head. Right there. Um, <laughs> but then as Arch, you talked about, you know, Atlanta wants to, to be physical up front and they want to run the football going up against a good run defense. So it's going to be a good matchup here. Which, which play caller – can set his team up for success, and then the players obviously have to go out and execute. That's just the name of the game. So we'll see how Atlanta is able to stack up against the Bears, their first of two away games to close out the season. Let's talk a little bit about the state of the NFC South because we talked about, okay, whether or not Atlanta still has a chance. There's a fighting chance to get in the postseason. they got to keep winning. The issue is they lost the game against the Buccaneers, and what have the Buccaneers been able to do? They just continue to win oh, football games, right? Question. I think they've won four straight now, sitting a game ahead of Atlanta. Um, I believe they're playing Saints in Carolina to close out the season, mm-hmm. so it's in division for them for two games. Um, Atlanta needs a slip-up, right? They need them to slip up a game, and then they've obviously got to play their best. I know it's hard. we can't sit here and just predict the future here, but the way that the team's – The Saints, the Buccaneers, Atlanta, how their schedule stacks up. Is this something that is is feasible for Atlanta to get into the postseason, DJ? I I think so. I mean, obviously, as we know, any division game is always going to be tough. And as we know, Tampa and New Orleans playing this weekend, that's going to be a game that both teams know the implications of. Mm -hmm. And if (laughs) it's tough to to say, hey, a lot of Falcons fans are rooting for those guys (laughs) in New Orleans. It's the it's what you got to go for because obviously if that happens that gives you a chance and obviously there are a couple other scenarios that got to go down uh, for the for the Falcons but that would be one domino that you would hope would fall for the Falcons to give yourself a chance in that week seventeen to say all right you got to go on the road in New Orleans to beat New Orleans you got a chance to go to the to the playoffs here it is in front of you and that's all you can ask for and obviously you you have hurt yourself throughout the season because you didn't win those games like you mentioned versus Tampa so you have to depend on other people yeah it's the it's the reality of the situation so i, I think right now uh, a lot of people in red and black are rooting for whoo the team up in uh Louisiana. It's like, so it's like quietly rooting yeah. for them for yeah. one week, right? Yeah. And then yeah. we're going to be absolutely against you like we always are yeah. in that final week of the season. Arch, Tampa sitting at 8-7 and seven right now. Falcons and Saints both at 7-8. and eight. So this one, uh, NFC South is coming down to the nitty-gritty right at the end of the season. Yeah, you just wonder, does Baker Mayfield come down to earth is, is kind of what you're hoping if you're a Falcon fan because that's what it's going to take. He's playing at a really high level. He, he f- closed the game here in Atlanta uh, with that drive and yep. threw the touchdown pass. Since then, dude's been playing playing really <laughs> well. So can Tampa do something or can uh, New Orleans do something to him in Tampa that gets him off his spot and maybe brings him back down to the median line where you, norm- you normally see him playing? He's playing above that right now. And I wouldn't count out, you know, obviously you got to take care of business yourself this weekend. And then if it doesn't happen this next weekend, then I'm not so sure that Carolina's a walkover for them either. Yeah. Carolina's pretty salty defensively. Yeah, they, they put it right up to the and, Green Bay last week. Yeah, weekend. played well this last weekend, had a chance to win that football game. I think that Bryce Young continues to get better. I think his, his play late in our game 
may have spurred him a little bit. So who, 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 who knew that we'd spur Breaker Mayfield <laughs> and now Bryce Young playing well the way those two teams have played. So anything can happen down the stretch, but all Atlanta can do is take care of what you can control, and that's go win your two can, games. Can, can Mike Evans sit out? If Mike Evans can sit out, that may I work. I mean, that would yeah. kind of help a little bit, right? <laughs> Dude, some guys just find a way to get it going right at the uh, end of the season, right? Yeah. And Mike Evans is one of those guys, especially when he gets 1,000 yards in sight, he continues to pour it on. Guys, before we close it out real quick, um, Falcons played on Christmas Eve this weekend. Any Christmas Eve, Christmas Day football memories from you guys? Did you play on that holiday? Do you remember it at all? Or was it one of those where maybe it was a loss and you tried to forget it? <laughs> The first game I played in as a Falcon was my rookie year. Uh, it was the last game of the season. We played Philly here on December the 23rd. Mm. That was the last game of the season yep. that year. Uh, it just happened to be unseasonably warm. It was like 65 degrees, but it was raining. And so I didn't start the game, but we were 6-3. We'd lost nine in a row, which we tended to do back in those days. And Philly wasn't very good either. Um, and so there was about 12,000 people in Atlanta Fulton <laughs> County Stadium to watch the game. So you, it was like a friends and family game beyond belief. That's all the people were in the in the stands. But I remember we were a da- we were down six three. While Henning walked over and said, "Kid, get get loose." I didn't even know where my helmet was. And so <laughs> I got the chart. I got a ball cap on. I start running around trying to find my helmet. Uh, and came in, and we ended up uh, coming back and winning the football game. Put 26 Let's on the ball. Let's go, Arch. Him, yeah. Beat him, beat him tw- <laughs> we beat him that day. Beat him that day. And so it was fun yeah. to play. But I just remember nobody saw it. Nobody yeah. – nobody, nobody, because back in those days, from a from a TV standpoint, it's not like all the games are on on Sunday ticket, right? You had to be reg- – and this was – you talk about regional broadcast. This wasn't like regional broadcast in the South. This is like regional broadcast if you had a TV inside the perimeter. <laughs> <laughs> it was all watching this real, game. Real, real. Yeah, it was. So it was. It was cool. But I remember being around Christmas. So I got to go home. Right, the next day, I had a flight out after we did our our end of the year physicals, and I flew back home. My parents were in Idaho, and and so that was cool to go back after playing that game so fresh, getting back out there. See this cool. this this really explains to me why Arch is really good at golf because, you know, usually <laughs> you know good golfers can just get out the car, and they could just go on the first tee box and just stripe one down the middle. Yep. Arch didn't know where his helmet was <laughs> and he goes in and he wins the ball game. So it, it makes Well, there was other guys that made plays in the game. I just happened to be uh, uh-huh. distributed yeah, a little yeah. bit. So nah, it nah, nah, it's nah, that, nah. It's that mentality, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, okay, I'm I just got my helmet or I just picked up my golf club. <laughs> like, <laughs> we got to throw one accurately yeah. here, I'm whether it's to a receiver or down the middle of the fairway. We're going to get it, baby. All right, so Atlanta needing to get a victory in Chicago and uh, prayers up, fingers crossed, toes crossed as we talked about the uh, forecast for this weekend that it holds true to be mid-30s with just cloudy and no precipitation, especially after the Jets and after the Panthers game. Yes, sir? You played college ball in Minnesota. I did. Did you like playing outside in the cold? When I was at Minnesota, we played played in Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome. Did you you have an indoor facility to practice? Correct, yes. Oh, you guys like, were, yes, yes. These guys are really soft. So we didn't <laughs> we we didn't have that at Iowa State. So okay. And so Iowa State. So what I'm trying to my point oh. is, my point is here. Uh, Chicago doesn't want to play in that weather either. Anybody yeah. Green Bay, you know, all oh, the the frozen tundra. They do not want to play on the <laughs> yeah. frozen tundra. Okay. Yeah. Now if they have to, the mentality is here, okay, if I gotta get up for, you know, it's eight eight months out of the year or six months out of the year and I got to plug my car in, I get a little hardened to the to the cold weather. Yep. It's a mindset. Yep. Okay, yep. I'm expecting it. Yep. Okay, we're we're not in that mindset down here. We don't have that, you know, no. so we don't. That's the only thing they have over Atlanta. There's a mindset that it's going to be cold, and so I know that. They do not want to play in cold weather. I guarantee <laughs> you that. No one wants to play in that weather. Every time, I, you know, living in the South, that I tell somebody that I'm from Minnesota, when it, especially when it gets cold down here, they're like, oh, you're used to this. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah. to your point, I'm like, you never get no, used to that's it. That's exactly right. You just right. know what to expect. And you got to deal and with you it. you know how to prepare for it. That's right? That's it. all that's it correct. is. So can Atlanta and the rest of these this team prepare properly for what they're going to face this weekend? Hopefully not too bad elements, but to go out and execute a game plan and come back with a victory over the Chicago Bears. That's uh, going to wrap it up here. Falcons 29-10 over the Colts this past weekend. Two games left. Got to win them both. Got to win the first one to get it started. Uh, I'm Derek Rackley, Dave Archer, DJ Shockley. This has been the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. We will see you 
next week. Mr. Indoor facility. <laughs> Indoors when it gets cold. Stay <laughs> inside. No. no chance. <laughs>